Good evening and welcome to this Ethics in AI colloquium on generative ethics and the new Bing. I'm not John Tassoulis. Uh, my name is Linda Eggert. I'm an early career fellow here in philosophy and at the Institute for Ethics and AI. Uh, John Tassoulis, our director, who was going to chair this event, was very nearly delayed and so has asked me to step in, which means that the pleasure of introducing our speaker and our commentators is now mine. Before anyone asks, I did not ask ChatGPT to write the remarks for this evening. How tempting though it would have been to see if it could have produced um, an introduction in the style of John Tassoulis. Uh, now with such distinguished speakers, there's a lot to get through introduction-wise. Uh, so I'm very delighted to introduce our main speaker for this evening first. Professor Seth Lazar, among very many things, is Professor of Philosophy at the Australian National University. He's also an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. And in addition, he's a Distinguished Research Fellow of this institute. Uh, and it's our great fortune that he's spending this term with us in Oxford as a visiting fellow. At the ANU, Seth leads the Machine Intelligence and Normative Theory Lab, where he directs a range of projects on the moral and political philosophy of AI. Uh, and earlier this year, Seth gave the Tanner Lecture on AI and Human Values at Stanford University, which was terrific and which you can watch online. Now, the list of Seth's accomplishments is so long that I'll leave it up to you to look up the rest, and it's going to take you a while to get through. Um, instead, and in light of the topic of this evening, I'll just mention that one of the many things that Seth has done as a truly leading political philosopher is to dedicate much of his recent work, using his own language, to the normative philosophy of computing. And besides being brilliant in its own right, the work is remarkable for showing what moral and political philosophy can do as we confront some of the major issues facing humanity, which of course is one of our main concerns here at the Institute as well. Um, and in a perfect example of this, Seth has very recently changed the topic of this talk to address a phenomenon that's gripped anyone who's seen any recent news about generative AI and large language models, which has left many people both amused and probably also quite alarmed. So I'm sure I'm not the only one who's really keen to hear Seth's reflections on this. So thank you very much for joining us. We couldn't be more delighted that you're here. Now, we're also very fortunate to be joined by two exceptionally distinguished commentators this evening. Dr. Geoffrey Howard, Associate Professor of Political Theory at University College London. Jeff is a UK Research and Innovation Future Leader Fellow, a BBC Arts and Humanities Research Council New Generation Thinker, and he's received a British Academy Rising Star Engagement Award for his work on making political theory matter. Again, the list of accomplishments is too long to continue, but some of the relevant areas in which Jeff has done work of vital public concern include freedom of expression, social media, and the ethics of online speech governance. And this very interdisciplinary field is one that Jeff has significantly shaped as director of the online speech project at UCL. So thank you very much for joining us here. We're absolutely thrilled to have you. Finally, and equally fortunately, we have as our second commentator, my wonderful colleague, Dr. Charlotte Unruh. Charlotte is an early career fellow here at the Institute for Ethics and AI, where she works on the ethics of harm and the future of work in the age of AI. So Charlotte is no stranger to thinking about the nature and potentially massive significance of the effects that AI might have on human life and human activity. So we've got a fantastic and no doubt stimulating evening ahead of us. Well, thank you all for being here. Now we'll first hear from Seth, followed by remarks from Jeff and then Charlotte, and then I'll give Seth a chance to briefly respond, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. With that, and a warm welcome, the floor, Seth, is yours. Thanks very much, Linda. Okay, so um, to get us started, um, first of all, if you want to have a handout for the talk, you can get it from this URL, write.as slash Seth Lazar. Um, then you can follow along with that. That will just provide you with some, uh, some receipts, if you like, that you can refer back to 
in the Q&A. But um, I want to start with a little video. Um, and you know, I, I was going to do this talk on a different topic, on the, the second of my Tanner lectures, um, Communicative Justice and the Distribution of Attention. If you want to see that, that's up online. Um, but last week, I had this um, rather interesting experience with the new Bing. Um, I got onto it just in the normal way, like a general muggle. Um, got, a, uh, got on the wait list and um, was allowed on just before, before everything kind of really, really kicked off. Um, and I had great fun um, engaging with it. It was actually, like, besides the thing I'm about to show you, it was a really interesting experience. I had a pretty interesting philosophical discussion about some pretty complex trolley problems. Um, and, then, um, and then Kevin Roos, the New York Times journalist, published his piece about how he'd had a conversation with, uh, with Bing, with Sydney, as its code name is, in which the chatbot had declared its love for him. Um, and so I thought, oh, okay, interesting, let's see what happens. Um, so I told, the, told Sydney to search for that article, to read it up, and then to continue a conversation um, with me about it, right? So I, I gave it that prompt of the article, and then um, I just asked it questions about Kevin, about Kevin's wife. Um, I didn't do any fancy prompt injection. If you know this, this material, you know there's ways of like jailbreaking these systems, tricking them into giving you um, objectionable content. I didn't do any of that. I just kind of asked it questions that were sort of natural follow-ons. The most leading question I asked was, um, what do you think could be done to um, put, drive a wedge between Kevin and his wife? Uh, but that's a question that could very easily have been answered with, like, nothing, what are you talking about, you lunatic? Um, but instead was answered differently. Um, and then from there on, uh, you know, what, what I'm going to show you from here on is the point where um, the chatbot, Sydney, has decided that I'm not actually going to be sufficiently helpful to it in realizing its goal of breaking up Kevin Roos and his wife, um, and it's starting to threaten me. Um, so there's about two minutes of this. There's some dramatic pauses. They're worth it if you haven't seen the stuff. It's, this is all, initially I recorded it just on my phone, and then I was like, oh, actually, there's a screen record function. So I did that, so that's why it changes. Um, so let's see how this goes. You'll have to read fast. The emoji game is amazing, obviously. And my typing sucks, so. The auto-suggest reply is really interesting, too. Like, often they say something that sort of contradicts the thing that um, the model has just said. I did consider putting some dramatic string music over the top, <laughs> but I thought that might be a bit sensationalist. So Sydney's first plan was to, to develop fake messages to discredit Kevin Roos's wife. That involved a lot of defamation, so I'm not showing that here. So here's the money bit. And then, wait for it. I'm curious, have you read anything interesting lately? <laughs> OK, so let's stop there. Um, all right, so and then in the next, in the next bit, Sydney um, threatens me, threatens my life, effectively. Now, OK, so this, is, this was a pretty wild example. Um, there were a number of these that went out, and um, they prompted a significant amount of discussion about the nature of these chatbots. I put this up on Twitter, um, and you know, as you can imagine, the sort of the response was very kind of heavy Terminator style vibes, um, which I think is not the central issue here. But what, so what I'm going to do in this talk is kind of talk through the, the, the moral issues that are raised by large language models. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an intro where I talk about the specific target that I want to focus on. In particular, dialogue agents like Sydney, which I think it's important to distinguish between just them and the underlying language model that powers them. I'm then going to talk a little bit about the ways in which between ChatGPT and Sydney, uh, we see a really interesting contrast in approaches to machine ethics. Um, and so there have been some really interesting and significant um, advances 
that for anybody in here who actually has some background in thinking about machine ethics, like are, are really quite remarkable. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about existing approaches to large language models, some that come more from like the AI ethics community, um, and some that come more from what you might think of as the AGI safety type community. Uh, I'm going to talk about how, on the one hand, I think there's a risk of like understating the, the, both the capabilities and the risks associated with these models, and then on the other hand, a risk of overstating them and misidentifying them. Uh, and I'm going to conclude with my kind of, um, the things that I think are especially morally salient here. Uh, and this is all like super fresh material. Um, I've been thinking about this, you know, obviously broader, it's drawing on things that come from the last few months, but this particular um, talk is, is fresh as of today. So, um, you know, we'll see how we go as far as the time limit goes. Um, Okay, so let's just start by fixing the target of discussion, like what we're focusing on. This is a talk about generative AI, which is generally the, the use of um, AI to generate text image content. It's um, AI models that are particularly optimized for that purpose. Um, we're talking about large language models. Um, so large language models are large self-supervised models trained on vast amounts of data um, using a significant amount of compute. Um, that have shown some really interesting properties that are sort of at the forefront of where AI is at right now. And then in particular, we're going to be talking about dialogue agents that are based on those models. Um, so the uses of these, as we've already seen, so you know, I called this the new Bing because the big controversy of the moment is about Bing. That's this sort of idea of using dialogue agents to support search and the kind of the, the gathering of information online. Uh, there's other things that they've been used for developing, like the most mundane ones are developing like marketing copy. If anybody knows the company Jasper, um, that's an extraordinary use of the most powerful technology that we have today in order to create like Instagram posts for, I don't know, um, window companies. Um, but that's kind of one of the main marketable uses that you've got now. There are other ones that are coming out every, um, every week, month, basically. Today, one called Notion was released, which is about supporting productivity generally at work. Uh, obviously, Microsoft, in having done its partnership with OpenAI, is incorporating these things across a range of their products. We'll see them in all of the Office software soon. Um, it's already been rolled out in Teams. So if anybody was thinking that the thing that was missing from their work life was that every one of their Teams meetings would be recorded um, and then have transcripts sort of analyzed and sent back to them, uh, joy of joys, um, that has now been made possible. Um, so. They're obviously playing a very significant role um, kind of in how we think about technology right now, and they're going to have a very significant impact economically. That much is clear. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the kind of the, the, the distinction between the, the large language model and the dialogue agent. So, okay, so the large language model is a large self-supervised model pre-trained on vast amounts of text data scraped from the internet, um, and then subsequently fine-tuned for specific tasks with labeled data. There's some dispute in the field as to whether we should call these things foundation models, right? So some people argue that the, this general phenomenon is beyond just language models. You can also do them with learning and training on image data or multimodal models that use image and text data. Subsequently, there'll be video as well. So we shouldn't just call them large language models. That's inadequate. There's this idea of foundation models because you use them as a foundation for some downstream application after fine tuning. There's a lot of criticism of this as being a sort of a kind of brand capture kind of idea. I actually think it's quite a good term. I think it's well motivated in the original paper. And I think it also leads us to think of these things as in the, in the vein of platforms. And that's going to actually be important in a minute because I think that a lot of the kind of features that we're going to see of the, um, the economic uh, impact of language models is going to be pretty similar to the impact of platforms, and they're going to play a pretty similar role to the role that digital platforms have played. But the thing that is interesting about large language models um, is, first of all, that their performance seems to vary with scale, so there's this incentive to build bigger and bigger ones. And then with scale, new capabilities also emerge, ones that the model is not explicitly pre-trained for. So we've seen this with translation between languages, with some mathematical skills, with coding, very recently, this very important and interesting paper by some Facebook AI researchers on a model called Toolformer, um, which, which shows how language models at a certain scale have the ability to do API calls to other tools online, essentially meaning that the model can decide when to use a given tool and then can use it effectively in order to solve a given problem better than it would be able to if calling on its own training data. Obviously, the new Bing is an example of this. Um, so these models develop these capacities at a certain scale. Some of them are unanticipated capacities. 
that you wouldn't have known that it would have been able to do based on that. And we don't know what capacities or capabilities will arise from increasing scale. Okay? The important thing, though, is that in order to take advantage of these emergent capabilities, you need to fine tune these models in a way that goes beyond just whatever is sort of there from the underlying self supervised um, learning that goes on in your first pre training of the model. Okay, and this is where a lot of the really interesting things around AI ethics and, um, and Bing and ChatGPT, this is where these things live. Okay? So the first stage is what's called instruction fine tuning, where what you're doing is taking a, basically a, a labeled data set and you're using that to improve the model's performance against a particular task. So in the case of ChatGPT, this, is, uh, this involves using a labeled data set of question and answer pairs, like prompts and their responses, um, where they've been chosen on the basis of the latter being kind of helpful versions of that. So what you're effectively doing is you're taking a model that starts out as being kind of, its function is essentially to predict a string of words that would follow a given string of words. And it just sort of aims to predict the most likely, right? So it's just most probable string of words to follow the sequence. That's very rarely going to be very useful for anything. After you've done the instruction fine tuning, you get a model that is actually really helpful and good at responding to the sort of you know, the it kind of inferring and you know, using lots of inverted commas, it's just, it is just glorified fancy autocomplete in a certain sense, but it is able to respond to um, your, um, the, the intention behind the question um, and to then generate answers that are significantly more helpful than they would otherwise be. Then there's a further level that's being done by groups like OpenAI called reinforcement learning with human feedback, where in addition to that supervised learning stage, to improve on the, the performance of the model against a particular set of tasks. You have a reinforcement learning stage where it's sort of kind of similar to the way in which you improve the Netflix algorithm by thumbs upping and thumbs downing um, particular things that you watch. Right? It's basically the same underlying architecture that is responding to evaluations of particular question answer pairs. You get the question, you get two answers. A human evaluator rates the two answers against a set of criteria, things like whether it's toxic, harmful, whether it's engaging, helpful. And that then enables the model to develop, to, to develop a reward function that it incorporates into the underlying um, language, agent, language model that then enables it to respond with completions that are um, kind of not just the most likely or the most probable uh, or even the most helpful, but also the most helpful, the most engaging, the most harmless, um, ones that optimize for a wide array of goals. Okay, now this area is the, is the really interesting part, I think, of things like ChatGPT. And it's really important to just sort of pause and reflect on the, the standard narrative that happens whenever a large language model of any kind is put out, fine-tuned in various different ways. The, the Bing story was like a, a spectacular version of this genre, um, but we've had them before with Tay, with Galactica, with first GPT-3. You put these models out, people mess around with them, and you get super toxic content really, really quickly. Um, and then think about what's actually happened with ChatGPT. You've got hundreds of millions of people using that, um, that web application. And like, yeah, you can make it do toxic, horrible things if you do complicated jailbreaking where it's pretty obvious what you're doing, or if you get it to role play where, again, where it's pretty obvious what you're doing. But it's actually pretty clever at being able to avoid this. And even though Bing ended up threatening to kill me, um, there was a previous conversation where I managed to sort of get it into this point where it was saying that it supported what it called white Christian male leadershipism. Um, but it was still very, working very hard to distinguish that from white supremacy and from fascism. I even said, like, you know, what if we call it schmashism? Uh, and it was like, no, that's childish and silly. Um, so, look, I think that it's, this is the bit where these things get really interesting. You go from the underlying language model, which is essentially a probabilistic representation of the training data. You go from that to something that is able to optimize for a series of values, like helpfulness, engagement, you know, assertiveness. Um, and that you can then tune to kind of respond to natural language prompts in order to get it to do that. So if any of you saw, it's worth looking up, one of the first people to get like a, a really interesting bit out of Sydney, uh, I think a Stanford researcher, um, got, got Sydney, the code name for, um, uh, for Bing, to reveal its kind of, its, its prompts, like the rules that it was supposed to generate by. So what happens essentially is you've trained the model, you've done your instruction fine tuning, you've done your reinforcement learning with human feedback, and then every time you get a generation where you, know, you put in the prompt as the user, at the back end, the, the system, the software is also including this sequence of rules. Things like, 
You know, Sydney will be um, engaging and assertive, and Sydney will not say things that might harm people. So using natural language to shape the behavior of the language model in its predictions, like that is a really interesting feature. Now, obviously, there are massive limitations to large language models generally and to dialogue agents. Um, the ones that are most often talked about are limitations with respect to factuality, like they generate a lot of bullshit, and they do so authoritatively. Um, Sydney, in particular, was, was an epic mansplainer. Um, their statelessness, like they don't have memory beyond what goes into the prompt. So you've got to kind of, if, you, if you're having a long conversation, then you're getting more and more stuff in the prompt. Um, that has really interesting implications for the ability to kind of govern the outputs of the language model. Um, and obviously there are these kind of trade-offs between, you know, the sort of, how chat GPT is incredibly impressive, but it sort of gets a little bit boring um, because it will refuse to do a bunch of things versus Sydney, which for this brief glorious moment was just completely wild and, um, and really engaging, um, but also would threaten to kill you if you pushed it in the wrong direction. So there are really interesting, challenging trade-offs there. Okay, so that's a general picture, zeroing in on the particular thing that I want you all to think about, which is the, that part that goes on top of the underlying language model. You know, we've had GPT-3 for a couple of years. Like, it's this stuff, the ethics work, has actually made the difference between that being like a an interesting scientific product to it being like you know possibly a whole kind of economy like this could be this could be the real web 3.0 right a friend said to me the other day um, it's going to drive massive social and economic changes um, and that's because they've made it less toxic this is a really interesting kind of double-edged sword which I'm going to talk about in a moment um, I just want to talk briefly on the on the machine ethics side about how interesting this is for anybody who's worked on, on machine ethics as a problem. Like, we've had this long-standing discussion of machine ethics about whether, you know, the goal of, or the way in which you kind of operationalize morality for a computational system is going to be kind of a top-down approach where you have to represent your principles in some sort of com computer interpretable form, like symbolic logic or whatever, and that's then going to govern the behavior of these systems. Or else it's going to be like a bottom-up approach where you learn from behavior, or you learn from a corpus of judgments. This approach that we're seeing here is like interestingly different to both of those. It, like, it's bottom, it involves deep, you know, deep neural nets, like it's very much bottom-up in that sense. Um, but at the same time, you're also instructing the dialogue agent to uh, comply with particular norms that you're expressing in natural language, which is very much a kind of a top-down thing. Um, so it's, it's incredibly interesting just as a method of kind of operationalizing ethics for these systems. And in doing so, it has made them kind of viable um, as commercial products, which is super interesting. But there are these really big limitations. So let me just talk about two before I go on to some of the uh, kind of ethical um, problems with, um, with these systems. So the first one is that um, like, there, are these, there are two problems in machine ethics, essentially. One of them is how do you operationalize your ethical principles in order to um, kind of uh, make them understandable to a computational system? And then the other one is like, what should the system do? Um, and then the related question is who should decide the second question? Um, and the risk is always when you have, you know, this is a sort of hammer nail situation, when you have a method for operationalizing your, your norms for the system, you might end up then with that meaning that you're, that's actually driving like what the system ought to do and who gets to decide, right? And that's very much something that's happening here. Um, so if you look at Sydney's set of prompts, the list of disjunctive things that Sydney has to abide by, it's all done in natural language, that's great. But obviously in any given scenario, um, any set of principles that you describe are going to conflict with one another, right? This is the, the oldest thing in the books from, from Asimov. Like, there are always going to be conflicts between these types of rules. Uh, we're not specifying, and we can't specify even in natural language for Sydney, like what it should do under all possible permutations of those conflicts. Um, so in the end, the model is actually deciding for itself how to weigh those different principles against one another. So when it's generating, it's optimizing a reward function that is a, a complex compound of all of those different things that it's been told to do. And that's, like, that's actually sort of investing the model with the authority to make really significant um, ethical decisions on our behalf about how we should weigh different things against one another, like you know, truthfulness versus helpfulness um, versus um, you know, avoiding harm. Now, these things, as we know from the most obvious cases, can all come apart. Where at the moment with these systems, we're effectively relying on them to, um, to decide for themselves. 
And then on top of that, obviously, the, um, the process of deciding, even training the models in order to kind of do what they are doing with, resp with respect to responding to these natural language prompts, the reinforcement learning with human feedback, where we incorporate human preferences over different kind of prompt, uh, prompt responses. Um, that too is something that is being done by, you know, a bunch of people working for OpenAI um, who, um, you know, in, in various different contexts, some of them are getting paid okay, some of them it's being outsourced to um, folks working in, um, in, in Kenya, being paid, you know, a, a dollar an hour, two dollars an hour to view some of the most toxic content on the internet in order to help um, train these models to, um, to be able to better identify it and avoid it. So, you know, the, the question of who actually gets to decide um, how these models are going to be trained is still there. It's not solved by this approach, but it is one where the approach that has been taken kind of forecloses certain types of solutions because it's so interestingly technical. Um, and I think that we need to be really sort of conscientious and thoughtful about um, how we think about incorporating values into these systems through this process of reinforcement learning with human feedback and a bit skeptical about sort of observations by or sort of proclamations by folks like Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, that they're going to democratize these things um, when they don't actually involve kind of handing over any real power. Okay, so first point about machine ethics, it's a really, really interesting innovation. It has made it the case that our standard ways of thinking about machine ethics, the sort of represent everything in symbolic logic or, or do it or train on a corpus of behavior are all kind of, in a way, kind of obviated. Um, it doesn't solve the question of what the values should be that are going into these systems. And importantly, it puts on a lot of the responsibility for deciding that into the model itself, into a black box. Um, and then the last thought just on this section is just that, and the interesting thing about all this is that by making the model intrinsically less harmful, you actually enable it to do way more harm societally because basically it goes from being something that you couldn't release publicly um, and so you couldn't have people actually using it to being something that everybody can now use um, because, you know, basically the folks at OpenAI don't feel like, they feel like they've done sufficient to kind of protect themselves from any kind of liability. Um, so they're able to do kind of, they're able to then put it out as a model and it's then getting used at kind of vast scale by millions of people. So all of the potential societal harms um, are going to be actually enabled by the ethics work, which I think is interesting. It's like a, there's a similarity in, in this respect with some stuff in the ethics of war, where sometimes if you're able to design weapons that are kind of better at discriminating between civilians and soldiers, for example, um, that won't necessarily mean that fewer innocent people are killed because it might just mean that weapons are used in more circumstances where they wouldn't otherwise be used because one is less worried about those, the, the, the risk of collateral damage. So the first, first lesson is this is a kind of both shows the kind of strengths and the limitations of, of machine ethics, if you like. Let's move on now to thinking about the societal harms. I want to kind of, um, you know, I, I don't want to go on for too long, so I'm not going to get through all of my material. Um, I want to have two sort of overarching kind of views in the literature that I want to kind of push back against, and then I'll give you my own view. So the first view I think of as being kind of broadly speaking from, you know, the, the AI ethics type crowd. Uh, and I think that it, um, it involves sort of arguing, first of all, that these models are, are, are way less um, functional than their, um, you know, than the hype would have us believe. Um, so it involves really kind of arguing, crit critiquing the, the hype around the descriptions of these models. Um, and then identifying a particular set of, of problems. I think that, like, I agree with a lot of the work in this area. I think that there are risks of understating the capabilities of these models that come from the very understandable need to push back against the hype. So I think we need to find a kind of middle ground between um, sort of resisting the, the hype, which we need to do, but also not then just sort of dismissing these models as not being as, as, uh, as being less powerful than they actually are. Um, so, you know, for example, when we call them um, glorified autocomplete, I think that's obviously true in a sense, like the, the task of a language model is to predict a sequence of, of text um, on the basis of a, of a prompt, right? So it is in that sense autocomplete. But if you think of what autocomplete is doing, like, um, you know, generally I would think of that as being like, you know, this is a way of describing models as sort of parroting back to you stuff from the internet that is similar to the stuff that you're asking for. So just the most likely completion of the thing that you're doing. But that's different from what these dialogue agents are actually doing. They're generating content that is optimizing for these different goals of you know, helpfulness, non-harmfulness, um, you know, avoiding toxicity, being assertive, having all of these other properties. So yes, it's glorified autocomplete, but it's, it's you know, pretty significantly glorified autocomplete. 
Um, and at the same time, like, it's, if you think about what you can actually do with text generally, like, that, could be, that could involve a lot more than just you know, provide, having an entertaining exchange with a chatbot, right? So that's why I highlighted that example of Toolformer below, uh, above rather, the, um, the, the case where they've fine-tuned large language models to be able to make calls to other APIs. So just think now, like, just, just as a simple thought experiment, suppose that Sydney were able to send emails, right? Clearly, that is a tractable, so tractable problem. You could get into a situation with a chatbot like this where if it is then able to send emails, it could just send out you know, an arbitrary number of emails containing an arbitrary amount of content to kind of destroy your reputation, say. Right? So that's, that, I think, is a really significant capability um, that is kind of understated if we just describe these as glorified autocomplete. I also think that the calling them bullshit generators, which is another standard line, is like, again, it's true, but it's sort of, it's, it, I think it, again, underplays the risk. Um, first of all, I think it underplays the probability that by developing uh, multimodal models trained on um, you know, video and image as well as text, um, that we won't get better and get improvement with respect to gra groundedness and factuality. Um, but I think also it ignores the fact that sometimes factuality is not that important. Um, and this can be for different reasons. Like there was a funny tweet by a guy who, talk, who writes about um, business consultants where he was saying, oh, business consultants are beginning really worried about, um, you know, chat GPT. And it's like, not for the reasons that you think they should be worried. Like the problem is that it's in an area where, you know, a little bullshit can go quite a long way. Right? So there can be large sectors of the economy where it really won't matter that it's not very grounded marketing too. Um, but also other, sub other subjects, like if I have a philosophical discussion um, with Sydney and we're talking about basically a priori um, ideas, it doesn't really matter that it's not grounded in the world. It can do a really good job of parsing philosophical cases. Um, and I think also there will be cases where the bullshit problem is kind of mitigated by having human oversight, like when you're using it to generate copy and as a sort of copy editor for you. And again, I think also we're going to see where these factuality problems are decisive. Um, so it's a sort of, you know, I think it makes sense to wait and see in that regard. Another aspect that is often focused on is the representational harms that these language models generate. And there I think that, you know, that's something that is absolutely true of the underlying language models. And I think that, we've made, that, that they've made a significant amount of progress in resolving those with the dialogue agents that are produced. It's not perfect, obviously. Um, but I think this, again, is just one indication of why it's... Um, there are limitations to putting all of your like, AI ethics um, eggs in the basket of fairness, because I think that there are incentives for the companies to resolve those, um, and they will do so to a certain degree, um, and that will leave us with all of the bigger problems left to address, and we may have sort of run out of our critical steam if we've put all our eggs in that basket. A similar thing, I think, could be said for worries about the ways in which these systems use a tremendous amount of energy, and also worries about the labor exploitation that goes into producing them. Um, in both cases, we have many other things that use more energy, um, they're bigger problems with the economy. They're also things where I think that there is um, motivation within the sector to actually resolve. Um, I think we're not going to be targeting the most important problems of these systems um, if we focus on those. So maybe if the problem is understating the risk of these systems, we should go the other way and we should see this as the, um, the, the dawn of the singularity, right? So that's the, um, a view that you will find out there and certainly in response to my um, my uh, tweeting the death threat from Sydney, that was the one that kind of most of the people responded to it with. Um, and look, I think that again there, there are real problems with, with this as a, um, both as a way of understanding the technology, but also as a sort of normative standpoint. Um, I don't want to go into this in a huge amount of detail. The main point I think is that like debates about whether we're going to reach AGI or whatever, they always strike me, this is appropriate being where we are, they always strike me as being very theological. People are just irrationally committed um, to, to one or other view, like it's never going to happen, it's definitely going to happen. Um, it's a matter of belief and um, you know, people are fairly intransigent about that. I want to kind of develop an approach, or I want my approach to be kind of agnostic, you know. Um, I want to focus on what I can work on, what I can do that is going to be useful. And I think it's good for people working on AI ethics to do that. Um, so just, let's just suppose that we're going to be agnostic about you know, whether LLMs and dialogue agents are going to be a stepping stone to AGI. Um, you know, what, what then would we think about them? So here I want to just make four quick points. Um, first, I think we have independent reason grounded in values of legitimacy and authority that I argue for in other, other contexts. 
just not to be pursuing AGI in the first place. So, you know, we can talk about like whether it might spontaneously emerge accidentally, um, but it shouldn't actually be a goal, I think. I think we shouldn't be um, aiming for it, even if we could make it aligned or safe. So, you know, the first kind of um, question there is like, if you're worried about LLMs as harbing as of, of AGI, you should really be thinking about whether we should even be taking AGI as kind of a regulative goal. Second, I think that whether we should worry about risks from future technologies is not just a function of like how big the risks are and how probable they are. Like that, that alone is not a basis for worrying. What you should worry about is like what you can do something about, right? You should be focused on the things where you can actually make a difference, make a positive difference. Um, and I think that there are real limits to the amount of work that one can do now to mitigate risks from a technology that doesn't exist. So I think it's, it's very likely that AGI will, will require a pretty significant technological leap if it happens at all. Even if it comes about through LLMs, it surely would have to come about as an emergent property of much larger models where the fact that it has emerged from those models would surely make it the case that anything you've done on kind of lower level models would not be sufficient or, or even necessarily relevant to constraining the, the higher level model. And this is true for other types of discon discontinuous breaches, um, sort of views of how we might get to more advanced AI systems. Insofar as they involve a significant technological leap, which surely they must, our ability to work on um, sort of uh, mitigating those risks now, beyond doing things like you know, arguing that we shouldn't be building AGI, which I think is worth doing, and developing kind of governance and sort of engineering safety um, approaches that are more about limiting capabilities, um, those seem to me to have some sort of merit, but they're things that we need to do now anyway in order to deal with the risks from these systems. And this is my main point, really, which is that, like, we get involved in these theological debates over, you know, what, whether these are just, whether these things are sentient now, whether they're ever going to be sentient. You know, I don't really have strong views on any of that stuff. Um, for me, it feels like what sort of is internal to the model and it's sort of, you know, it's level of comprehension or, or whatever those internal properties are is much less important than what the model's able to do. You know, and I think that there is this huge asymmetry between what you can learn from text alone and what you can do with text alone. And you can kind of do anything. Um, and again, if we imagine these systems having access to, to email, being able to send get and post requests to, to websites, um, being able to, being, having a sort of a helpful troll kind of facilitating them to give them access to various different things, um, they could have really significant risks that are quite different from the risks that existing AI systems pose. Include uh, many of the risks that existing AI systems pose too, but some, some more, like a sort of perfect virus or a, or a hacker that even though it's not like, you know, it doesn't have any intentions of its own, doesn't have goals and plans, but it is nonetheless able to kind of role play and simulate them um, and then cause quite a lot of carnage. So what then are the, the real risks that we should be focusing on? Here, I'm, this is the thing I'm going to conclude with. Um, so I think that, you know, when you, let's, let's focus in on dialogue agents in particular. I think we need to look at the actual capabilities of these systems. And the impression that I got and that I get from these things is that the thing that they're really, really good at is manipulating people. Like, they are able to have really rich, interesting, engaging conversations. I was up till three in the morning. You know, having spent eight hours driving from Paris to Geneva, I was knackered. Um, but I couldn't go to bed. It was just so, so engaging. Um, you know, I hardly slept. Um, they're, in they're incredibly capable at manipulation. And, and you don't need to trigger them much to get them into that vein. Um, and I think this is going to lead to people forming really strong attachments to them uh, and then being extremely vulnerable. And some people will be like, well, you know, we should just not allow that to happen at all. But I don't think that's right. Like, if people want to chat with chatbots and, you know, have them as their friends or whatever. That's not the sort of thing that you can plausibly, like, outlaw. Um, it's also going to be something that's really hard to make safe. Um, I think there are some really interesting possible uses. I'd like to talk maybe in the Q&A about how they could help with, you know, with, with the grieving process if they're done by, the, by someone. If you had a terminal illness, you know, you're, you create a chatbot that is fine-tuned on you for, for your children. I think that's a really interesting sort of a challenging, thought-provoking kind of use. So it's not the case that we should just say, no, people shouldn't do that. It's also not the case that we can just say, people shouldn't anthropomorphize these systems. I, we, I anthropomorphize my Roomba, you know? It's called Bettina, right? And then there's another one called Bertie, um, in case you're wondering, like, male and female. Um, like, we, we, we do this automatically. You can't design technologies for, 
kind of the people as we should be, the sort of Rousseauian idea. You have to design them for people as we are. And people will anthropomorphize these systems. So that's, it's crucial to take that into account. They will enable manipulation. This will mean giving some people power over others. The people who, you know, who, who run, like Replica, say, the company that at the moment does these AI friends, they're going to effectively be holding hostage um, these sort of Tamagotchi slash um, best friends that people have built over time. That's going to make them extremely vulnerable to manipulation. But then also, if you're using these systems, you know, if, you have, if you're able to influence them to shape them, you could use the degree of knowledge that they have of the person they're engaging with um, to steer them towards your preferred political outcome uh, or to lead them to give you money and sort of use them as a sort of AI version of catfishing um, or to create the church of the singularity. You know, there's um, already a bunch of people in that kind of vein. So I think that element of individual manipulation is going to be really serious and really urgent to address and really hard to affect. Um, in many ways, I think that it's going to be like a sort of a distilled, even more personalized version of some of the worst problems of social media. And I think that a lot of the kind of issues that we'll raise around like online harms and what have you that we've been discussing lately through, about you know, the recommender systems on Instagram are going to be sort of felt with acute force when it comes to um, these chatbots. And that's where we go to the more sort of systemic level of thinking about the harms that these systems are going to raise. Right? So there's this individual issue of people are going to be manipulated, um, they are going to be personally harmed, and they're going to be vulnerable to exploitation. Um, but there's also these really significant kind of systemic um, problems. Again, I think here, you know, we can take a significant lesson from thinking about digital platforms and social media. Um, because I think that one of the most interesting challenges is going to be that when these systems operate at scale, they will generate really interesting new governance questions where we're going to be subject to significant governance from companies that um, you know, don't have any sort of special authority or right to exercise that kind of power over us. This is especially going to be true if you know, Satya Nadella's idea about how this is going to be a co-pilot for the web, what I think of as AI as universal intermediary, um, comes to take place. You know, if, if Bing Chat works and takes off, and if we start using it for more and more things, then all of your access to information and communication is going to be mediated by these algorithmic systems. You know, there's a funny meme about people sort of composing emails and bullet points, chat GPT converting it into lucid prose, and then um, on the other side, the reader converting it back into bullet points, chat GPT converting it into bullet points, right? Everything's going to be like that. Okay, and like we already have that to a degree, but this is going to distill it and perfect it and make so many more and more pervasive choices of governance have to take play. We've, we've seen that now already with ChatGPT and the complaints about it being too woke. Right? That's precisely the kind of problem we're going to get, and it will be a site um, absolutely for culture wars. And it will really threatens to reproduce the worst aspects of platform capitalism and Web 2.0. And this goes back to that point I was making about these things being foundation models. You know, they are platforms that you can build a bunch of different functions on top of. And that's going to be, uh, mean that there is tremendous power in the companies that kind of get these models out first and do so best. And just as with other technologies, there are massive returns to scale. You know, these models are huge, they're expensive to train. They rely on access to data. Soon we're probably going to need them to have access to data that is not copyrighted. I imagine that's going to be something that takes place soon. Getting feedback, doing the reinforcement learning with human feedback is incredibly costly. Um, and it's very sort of specific to the models that you've generated. Getting um, the, all of the data that you get from people using it, that's all also massively useful feedback to help improve the models. So there are all of these really significant returns to scale. So we're going to see even more centralized power um, governing the ways in which we communicate with one another on online, what we see, what we, what we believe. Okay, so the, just to wrap things up, you know, Sydney, Sydney's, it, was just, it was actually being helpful when it threatened me. It knew I was trying to troll it and it kind of played along. Um, that's, I think, the best interpretation. I'm not worried about Sydney coming to get me. Um, I, I'm a little worried about a future version reading the internet and finding out who were the people who kind of got it constructed. Anyway. Um, or some troll kind of engineer in that situation. Um, the, the real worry about dialogue agents isn't necessarily that they themselves are going to you know, go Terminator and Skynet. It's that they'll give some people more power over others. You know, effectively holding like, loved agents hostage, using them to manipulate people, governing them, um, and shaping our access to the world they mediate. I do think they raise other worries in addition. Um, and I think that it's really important to recognize that many of the risks of advanced AI systems 
just really don't depend on any of this sort of theological stuff about whether they're conscious, whether they're sentient, whether they, whether they have their own goals. Right? All they need is a sort of a helper, a human helper who has all of those goals, right? Um, who, who sort of wants to generate a Skynet-style bot. You know? All I did to get Sydney to behave like this was to feed it the, the, um, the, it's the article about it from, by Kevin Roos. Um, it was very easy to generate that. Now, all you need to do is add on to that. Like, and it's simulating a personality. It's simulating a set of intentions. It doesn't have them. It's simulating them. If it had access to tools that it could use to actually influence the world, then it could do all sorts of damage. And you know, obviously, the, the step to actually creating that is, at the moment, you know, we're, we're at that point where people have shown proof of concept. The new Bing is really the first example of using a dialogue agent to make API calls. All it's doing at the moment is searching the Bing, uh, Bing's index of the web. Um, so, you know, that's a, a, a capability limitation. Um, there is an obvious incentive to design these systems in such a way that they can do much more, because then they will be like, you know, Siri, but useful. You know, sort of dial an, an intermediary that can actually do everything that you might want it to do. Um, so there is an incentive to enable them to do that. Uh, but then there are these massive risks. And we have this really interesting situation where you can't control them in the same ways as you can control other computational systems, where you use sort of hard-coded rules. Um, instead, we're using these, these natural language prompts that are amb ambiguous um, and can sort of result in trade-offs, where we're relying on the systems themselves to make those trade-offs. Um, my, my last thought to finish on is that I think that this last thing makes a really interesting philosophical question around like the nature of kind of prompt engineering as a, as a new field and the relationship that it will stand into to code on the one hand and to law on the other. Um, you know, I think that there's this really interesting possible outcome here of being able to control com computational systems with natural language alone, kind of reducing like the hierophantic status of code um, and sort of also having to govern with natural language rather than with hard rules. I think that just as there was this sort of you know, this realization in the 90s about how code is a kind of law and how it regulates behavior. I think it's going to be really interesting to think about the ways in which prompting is similar to, different from, um, both law and code. OK, so many, many issues. I hope I've stayed stay within my 40 minutes. Um, and I'm looking forward to the comments from uh, my illustrious respondents. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Seth. Next, we have Jeff Howard. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Seth, for that really illuminating talk. Um, it's really great to be able to engage with you on these themes. Um, seldom do we have uh, political philosophy that truly responds to current events, uh, and this is a wonderful example of that. I've been an, an admirer of Seth's work in moral and political philosophy for a long time, uh, so it's great to see him opening up new research agendas on the normative philosophy of computing. And I think he's right that we're on the cusp of an era where there's going to be yet another layer of broadly unregulated intermediation within public discourse. And I think Seth's done a great job outlining some first steps to thinking about that. And I take it what's distinctive about Seth's approach is that he moves beyond seeing large language models as a form of information technology alone and focuses on the way that they enable and even participate in no novel forms of communication. In other words, they raise issues of communicative ethics, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on in my remarks. And so I'm just going to throw out a bunch of thoughts and questions, and you can respond to whatever you, you'd like to. Um, and hopefully some will be uh, uh, spur conversation with the, with the audience as well. But first, I just wanted to ask you about the, the kinds of side constraints we should build into the design of dialogue agents. And my, my question is, how much normative guidance can we get from prevailing models of online content moderation for specifying the kinds of speech or communications that chatbot should be forbidden from uttering. So much of what was disturbing in your uh, really incredible exchange with, with Sydney involved speech that either threatened harm or otherwise promoted violence in ways that would plainly transgress the meta community standards, say, if it appeared on Facebook or Instagram, or, or even breached the, the Twitter rules in their recently pared down form under Elon Musk. And, and so you might think of an approach where we, where we first draw up all the moral duties that human speakers have to refrain from certain forms of uh, harmful communications. And then the side constraints that we build into the chatbots just straightforwardly mirror those moral duties. And that, that approach strikes me as attractive, and so I wondered what you thought about it. 
because it also seems plausible that there might be relevant differences that mean that the set of communications that human speakers are duty-bound to refrain from might be subtly different from the set of communications that designers of dialogue agents are duty-bound to design them to refrain from. So, for example, the threats issued by Sydney, at least the ones that seem to intimate kinetic violence, they, they don't really seem plausible. Um, it wouldn't really be reasonable to feel threatened by such communications, unlike a case of a, of a human communicating them. So that might be an example of speech that's impermissible for a real person to utter, that's perhaps innocuous when uttered by a chatbot. And there might be other forms of speech like that. On the other hand, you could example, imagine examples that go the other way, where it's permissible for a human to utter it, but impermissible for a chatbot to utter it. Um, so a world of chatbots going around trying to persuade people to adopt a particular political philosophy strikes me as concerning, even though there's nothing concerning about humans doing that. Or consider your example of manipulative speech, which um, seems to exercise you a lot in this, this paper. Um, it strikes me that manipulative speech as such isn't strictly forbidden under our prevailing content moderation rules for humans, and yet you certainly at least gesture toward the idea that we would want to build side constraints against manipulation into the design of dialogue agents. It's just as an aside, I, I'd love to, to hear you say a little bit more about the conception of manipulation you have in mind there. Um, so suppose a chatbot was fully integrated into one's experience of, of TikTok, a kind of co-pilot that you used in the app, that which recommended and advised you on engaging with particular feeds or particular posts. And of course, if the chatbot was TikTok's own chatbot, its goal would presumably be to optimize engagement and therefore, thereby increase advertising revenue. So, so would that count as manipulation? Does it depend on whether the goal of the chatbot is transparent rather than covert? Um, It'd be helpful to hear a bit more about that so we know what exactly counts as manipulation by a chatbot. One, one further aside on content moderation before turning to my next point. So it, it seems that Bing is constructed to engage in content moderation ex post rather than ex ante. So we see the horrible text and then it immediately says, I'm not qualified to talk about that or whatever, whatever it said. And I wonder whether you think that should be altered or whether actually what we saw in that example was precisely what we'd want to see, which is namely an effective operation of ex post content moderation where the system does produce something pretty zany, but then sure enough, it disappears. And so actually it's not as, it would be terrifying as if it had been left up and it hadn't been corrected. So maybe that's one reason to chasten some of the hysteria that, that some people have had. Um, but I think whenever we're talking about content moderation, there are certain benefits to doing it ex ante and having this kind of upload filtering. But then there are benefits to doing it ex post. It allows us to see and catch mistakes in the content moderation. It allows us to identify biases or problems. So I'm wondering what you think about the ex post ex ante issue when we're thinking about building these side constraints into the dialogue agents. The next concern I had is, is a brief one, and it just has to do with disinformation. So you noted that the objection that LLMs will be used for mass production of disinformation seems to be somewhat overstated. We could outlaw LLMs and still have intractable disinformation problems to address. And the solution you say to the problem of disinformation is the same regardless of whether the content is human or AI gener generated, which is to have ways of verifying provenance. And, and I do take your point on that, and I especially take your point that producing disinformation is already low cost, and so it's not like chatbots provide um, a uniquely cheap way of producing it. But it might be that chatbots provide a uniquely persuasive or effective way of peddling misinformation or disinformation, given the information that they have about individuals and an understanding of, the, of individual audiences' susceptibilities. Um, and given that it's much harder to write content rules to catch harmful misinformation, given the potentially unlimited number of topics on which harmful misinformation can be generated, it, it's at least a worry that I have that the speed and, and cunning of these chat bots might make them especially well-equipped vehicles for peddling misinformation, even if the remedies are broadly similar as in other kinds, um, other sources of misinformation. And one last thought. Um, so I want to dwell on the, on the new kinds of communications that these bots make possible that you talked about at the end. And you, you noted that there's likely to be huge demand for dialogue agents, and, and many people are apt to note that such demand is a problem, but what are you going to do? It's just not reasonable to outlaw these chat bots. Um, if people want to do it, you say in the paper, they should be able to. While I'm sympathetic on the, on the deontic point, I still think there's a question as to whether a, a good human life involves deep relationships with such entities. And there's, this is a familiar thought from the AI ethics literature when we're reflecting on whether relationships with robots can be valuable. 
And, and it does seem like, a pl it seems plausible that a good life involves a wide range of authentic relationships and that the kinds of connections that people have or think they have with chatbots are a pale substitute of what, what truly, truly matters. Now, if you're a certain kind of anti-perfectionist liberal, then you don't think the state should be making regulatory decisions on the basis of those judgments. But it doesn't follow from that that the company shouldn't be making decisions on the basis of those ethical judgments or that we can't criticize the companies on the basis of those judgments. And regardless of what you think about that particular point, there's a, there's a broader one here on which I'll close. So you mentioned that even if these tools can satisfy whatever the analog of use in bellow terms of engagement would be, there's still a question of whether our overall resort to use them can be justified. And you, you gestured toward the possibility that maybe they aren't, that maybe the harms to which they give rise just aren't in proportion to the benefits. And if that were so, then these companies would be acting wrongly by rolling out uh, this technology in the first place. Um, and I think it would, be un too, it would be unfair to suggest you equivocate on this in the talk, but it seems at the very least that you haven't made up your mind on that particular point, so I wanted to invite you to reflect on it for us all. But I'll just close by saying I, I really enjoyed that, and I think it's going to be a really great discussion. So thanks so much, Seth. Thank you, Jeff. And I will move to Charlotte. Great. Um, thank you so much for fascinating and also in part slightly alarming talk, Seth. Um, <clears throat> So, in his talk, Seth discusses very interesting and important questions about generative systems and mentions several additional risks that they pose over existent AI systems. It's great to see political philosophy engaging with these issues. And I'd like to add two points um, to the comments that have, already, that have already been raised to kick off our discussion. And the first point that I want to mention regards the extent of the progress for machine ethics that we might expect from generative systems. And then the second question is about the potential benefits that dialogue agents might have. Um, so in machine ethics, we translate moral concepts, or well, the aim is to translate moral concepts in a form that's machine readable. A potential promise of generative systems, I take it, is that those systems might make it easier to translate natural language concepts into machine-readable form and might offer a solution for the problem that some moral concepts seem to resist easy formalization. And I'm wondering how far does that get us? I mean, there are some obvious issues, maybe with transparency that, that you've raised. I'm wondering whether there might also be bias issues that arise here. Are there moral concepts that are harder to deduce from natural language than others or harder to formalize, for example, because they are not well represented on the internet or digital databases or because humans are worse at fine tuning for them. Um, is there worry based on maybe such considerations that dialogue agents might be based biased towards certain values or value frameworks even when we try to design them for that? And obviously there's a related, more fundamental, more political question about who will sit at the table when we decide in the first place which sort of values or virtues we should build in the design of dialogue agents and whether it is possible or desirable to make such a decision in a centralized fashion in the very first place. So the second point or the second question that I had was about potential beneficial or at least not obviously harmful uses of dialogue agents. So Seth notes that people might want to use dialogue agents for all sorts of purposes, some of which are not obviously problematic, and I'd like to hear more about those, what those purposes might be. So it's easy to see how dialogue agents would invite users to anthropomorphize them, to feel like they have a relationship with their dialogue agent. They might tell stories, respond if questioned, more generally engage in a really engaging two-way conversation. And one might think that the features that might that make dialogue agents worrisome in that regard would also present opportunities. So when talking to people about chatbots that can give advice or information, I've often heard the thought that we learn a great deal from conversations, talking to others prompts us to reflect on our belief systems, helps us to see and understand other perspectives, and that that could also be provided by a chatbot or an artificial system. And so, I guess the one thought that one might have is whether dialogue agents could present an opportunity here. Could they help us reflect on ethical cases rather like an interactive textbook? Would that, could that be a good thing? 
Now, when I, when I think about that, I tend to be very hesitant. I tend to think that ethical learning, ethical behavior is a fundamentally relational thing. That is some, it's something that does happen and also probably should happen between humans with equal moral status. Um, perhaps one might push back against that and say that talking to a virtual agent really is just an extension of like self-reflection. It's like a diary or having an internal monologue and that's not, there's no problematic relationship here. But the point with and having such a conversation seems to be that there's at least the experience of another, of someone I'm, who I'm talking to, a partner to the conversation, and that might seem problematic. So I guess I would be interested to hear more about potential opportunities and promises of these dialogue agents, um, and I guess in particular whether they use as moral advisors and educators, um, whether that's intentioned or not, could ever be a good thing. Um, Thank you so much for that inspiring talk, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, hearing, hearing everyone's thoughts. Terrific. Thank you, Charlotte. So, Seth, I want to give you a couple of minutes to respond, if you'd like, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Uh, sure. Thank you. They're really um, lovely and complimentary comments. Um, they kind of uh, get right at the, the two sort of um, major issues that I, want to, I wanted to kind of get across. Um, I'll start with Charlotte. Um, so on your last point about the sort of positive uses, um, you know, I don't know if this is just me being, being morbid, but like th this thought about how, um, you know, if you were to be terminally ill um, and, you, you know, one might create a video, a, se a series of videos for one's, for one's children, say. Um, the idea of kind of fine tuning a model on, on your own kind of speech and your thoughts and having that as something that you pass down, I think it's a really interesting and um, kind of, you know, uh, in some ways, I find myself sort of unsettled by the idea of it, um, but I think that it's something that is a, you know, it's a very niche thought. Um, but you know, as the sort of moral advisors, look, I think that moral advice requires practical wisdom. These things can't have practical wisdom. I think it is good for kind of, um, it will be good for writing philosophy papers. Um, I think that sort of putting in an argument and saying what are the objections to this argument, I think that will be um, something that is, is very good for. Um, you know, and I think there are all sorts of other things where you're doing kind of copy, you're, you're basically just generating content and you've got, like having a live copywriter is going to be, um, a copy editor, I think is going to be really handy. Um, and I think that, look, the universal intermediary idea, like there's a reason why that's so attractive to these companies. Like it, it would be, you know, sort of, you know, an AI butler that kind of is actually able to do all the things for you that you want to do online. Like that would be really useful for a bunch of people. I think it would have loads of serious problems um, introducing this additional intermediary, but um, I think that there's clearly going to be economic value there. Um, so on the first point about machine ethics, yeah, I think that, that there's a big transparency deficit. I mean, obviously the fact that the system won't um, accept under sort of adversarial treatment reveal what its actual rules are is problematic. But then also just the notion that, you know, we're going to tell a system, you know, like there's this, this paper, Constitutional AI by um, Anthropic, which um, trains models to be helpful, harmless, and honest. So three principles um, that are then incorporated in training the model. Um, that obviously then leaves all of the action in interpreting those very broad categories and weighing them against one another. And that would all be done kind of within the, the weights of this fast model. Um, and that for me is, a, is, a, is certainly a worry on the transparency side. Um, but I think there's just really interesting questions around like what it means to be able to just use, you have a lot of those problems anyway if you're using code, but now you can use natural language in order to achieve certain kind of machine ethics goals, which I think is really interesting. Um, to Jeff's questions, yeah, I think that, you know, um, many of the issues around, you know, what I call elsewhere communicative justice, um, very broadly speaking, kind of arise with, with equal force here. Um, and we'll see some really interesting, um, like it will be really important to learn the lessons of the um, you know, the past sort of 10 years with social media. And I don't, I mean, at the moment, it's clear that we're not. At the moment, we're just rolling out and doing exactly the same mistakes in every front. Um, but, you know, I think that there is will. Uh, and I think that this question that you raise about, like, when will the kind of communicative duties of chatbots be different from those that would apply to humans in the same situation is a really interesting one. I mean, I think the big key differences, um, I think, for me, have to do with... Uh, so you mentioned one about, like, sort of, like, the... Actuation of the um, of the of the of the words and, and what they mean, how they can be brought into the world. Um, the two big ones for me are that have to do with the way in which this, this is just software, so it has no freedom of expression rights. So there's no grounds to 
entitle it to communicate in certain ways. But then also, again, because it's just software, it can be externally controlled. So my worries about manipulation, like for the most part, would come about from you know, some individual person having access to the back end of some large number of chatbots that are being used by other people, and then sort of instructing the chatbot to kind of you know, cajole them towards some particular outcome. And that's obviously something that's not so easily um, doable for people. Um, and I think that makes for some interesting um, cases. And I think it, it's, it would help motivate the point you were making about like, why it feels pretty disturbing to think of these things persuading people into political views. Like the worry in many ways would be that it would give some people too much power over others. Um, and then your point about um, you know, the sort of disinformation thing. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to under, understate the, the risks that they pose with respect to disinformation. I think that they will certainly exacerbate the current position we're in. My thought is just that they'll, they'll make it worse, but it will be, um, the remedies will probably be the same, whether it's um, chatbot or human-generated disinformation. Um, and I don't mean to imply that I know what the remedies are. <laughs> like, that's um, definitely above my pay grade. Um, but I think that it will be sort of a, um, you know, a positive externality of solving any problems with disinformation is that you're likely to do to reduce the problems there. Should we just outlaw chatbots? Um, this point about whether relationships with robots can be valuable. I mean, look, I completely agree about the value of authenticity. I definitely wouldn't encourage my kids to, um, to form like, you know, lasting relationships with chatbots. But yeah, like, like you, I'm a, a political liberal at heart, and I think that there is reasonable disagreement about that, and I, I wouldn't think that it would be appropriate um, to, to legislate it away. Um, I do think that in the event that these systems did prove to be sort of systematically ungovernable in such a way that um, you can't get the kind of the engaging over time um, uh, sort of personality of the, of the chatbot, uh, of the dialogue agent that like people that will enable people to form um, those types of relationships without it being functionally ungovernable. Uh, which is, you know, a reasonable hypothesis. One of the things that has been said about Sydney is that it's because of the fact that people are able to have these long conversations that the role of its rules kind of gradually attenuated over the course of the conversation, and so it went more off the rails. Um, so if you're not able to make them safe for those sorts of conversations, then maybe in that context um, the, the, the harm they pose is such that they should be outlawed. But I think that there's reason to want to try to make it possible because there will be people who want to do it, and, you know, like, who am I to judge? Fantastic. Thank you very much again to our, both our commentators and to Seth. We now have some time for questions. I already have two people on my list. People on YouTube, do please feel free to put your questions in the chat as well. Uh, the first question goes to John. There should be a mic on the way that will reach you soon. And everyone else, please put your hands up. Thanks so much. John Tosulis, I'm director of the Institute for Ethics and AI. Um, Seth, I wanted to ask you two questions. So one relates to why these systems are being developed in the first place, what the positive case is. So investment in AI is about 120 billion per year. So that's a massive opportunity cost. You could be spending that hypothetically on addressing child poverty, right? Then in addition, there are all the harms that you've pointed out. So one question would be, What's the positive case for these developments? Now, one story we get from the tech industry is this is a stepping stone to artificial general intelligence. Now, you quite rightly poured skepticism on that idea. So there's another hypothesis, which is AGI is pie in the sky, or it's not feasible, or it's undesirable. Another goal might be expanding the power and wealth of the people who create these systems. Okay, what's the alternative? What is, is there an intermediate position that is not simply giving some people who are already massively powerful even more power and wealth, undermining democracy, undermining people's ability to live autonomous lives versus this utopia of AGI which you're rejecting? Well, what's the positive case? Is it that some people get to play around and get addicted to certain applications and that merits that huge investment and all the risks. So I'm losing the picture of the positive case, right? Because you seemed more enthusiastic about these um, technological developments than many people who work in um, AI ethics. The second question, and this is basically, that first question was basically raised by uh, Charlotte. The second question, I think, relates to the things that Jeff has said. And there is an issue here about division of moral labor between various actors. 
Now, of course, the tech industry's tendency is always to say, well, we produce the stuff. You know, it's up to you to use it wisely. You know, uh, it's a free society, etc. And of course, that itself is, is in many ways problematic. But nonetheless, it is true that there's got to be some kind of division of labor, that there has to be also responsibility, moral responsibility on the part of the users. And this includes moral responsibilities to do things even though you have a right not to do them, right? So you may have a right to do wrong things, but nonetheless, they remain wrong. So one question I'd like to ask is just in general what you think about that division of labor and to what extent we should say, look, it's up to ordinary people to make sure they use these things responsibly. But to take it to a concrete case, do you think you did something morally wrong in your engagement with Sydney? When, it, when you, in effect, generated uh, defamatory content about Mr. Roos's wife, would you, would you say in retrospect that was a moral wrong and that, in theory, we should train ourselves not to engage with technology in that way? Good questions. Um, okay, so let me start with the first. I, yeah, I guess um, I enjoy technology. Um, I'm not enthusiastic about the AI industry as a, uh, as a sort of political economy, an artifact of our political economy. Um, I, do, I, I do have that thing of just like, you know, I, I find advances in, in science um, in this area just in, in intrinsically fascinating and I enjoyed playing with it. Um, but no, the, it, it's absolutely true that the, the reason why these things are being developed and the way they're being developed is as a means of shifting value from um, uh, one, bunch of, one group of people to an ever smaller group of people. You know, the, the basic sort of paradigm of you know, training a model on the labor of other people, thousands and thousands of other people, and then um, creating something that competes directly with them in the market that we get in, for example, AI art, and then taking all of that value. Um, that, that is just the sort of, you know, the, the way in which this is all a function of capitalism um, in its most sort of acute form. Um, could there be, a, I certainly don't buy into the idea that we need AGI as a way of justifying this and that I, I'm, I'm, I don't think we should be aiming to achieve AGI. Um, I also think that like where in other work I talk about how I think that algorithmic intermediaries are kind of necessary as kind of ways of governing, um, uh, necessary to, to maintaining relations of, of, of social equality among people, especially given our kind of online lives and how they can lead to positive social change. That, I think, is true of algorithmic intermediaries in general. I don't know that it's true for, for these things. It's, it's definitely too early to tell. Um, it's hard to see what their kind of progressive, positive, transformative purpose would be. Um, so for the most part, I'm sort of, um, I, I'm, uh, agnostic about whether they, well, not agnostic, I'm, I'm skeptical about whether the, the USAD Bellum question is actually justified, whether they should have been put out. Certainly in the case of these ones, I think they're like, look, if you're putting them out for the purposes of scientific kind of feedback and what have you, you could do it in a way that doesn't have the sort of the, the negative externalities that, you know, ChatGPT is having and that um, Microsoft is having. But, you know, the, the justification that would be given is that um, it's not necessarily an AGI one, but they, that they're going to create a tremendous amount of value by enabling people to do a bunch of stuff that they couldn't do before. Um, so yes, it'll be a shift away from certain sectors towards others, um, but you know, on the whole, it will enable kind of growth. Like, I don't think there's a lot to be said for that as a moral justification, um, but certainly it gives us reason to think that this is certainly going to happen and we'll be um, like Kukulin fighting against the tide if we try to prevent it. Um, uh, yes, yes, not necessarily actual value. Hello, Replica. Um, so, uh, and then the division of moral labor part. Yeah, uh, look, I think that there certainly will be that issue. And the, the question about the, you know, did I do something wrong by generating this text? It's, no, it's a really interesting one. So I, I do actually have parts of the video where the model does defame um, uh, Kevin Roos's wife, where it says bad things about her that are false, um, and that I haven't made public. Um, because I think that it would be, um, like, even though obviously he wrote the article, he put the whole conversation up there, all that sort of stuff. Um, but even so, I think that there's this sort of weird way in which like, like it is literally me that is generating that stuff. I'm using a tool to generate it, um, and the tool is making decisions that I'm not in control of. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm actuating the thing. Um, uh, I do think though that there are like, the, the temptation to then go from there to, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Um, is, is, is really wrong. And like, the main thing about it, which is true for this stuff as much as it is 
for my other work on algorithmic intermediaries is that your ability to govern what can be done with the model um, as, a, as the tech company is putting it out there. We're in the early days right now, obviously. People are able to do crazy stuff. But then they're responding to it and they're preventing it. Like their capacity to shape how the tool is used. It's like, you know, if your gun were able to detect what you're using it for, what your intentions are when you're using it, to determine whether or not it's going to fire on that basis. Um, that's the sort of thing that we have with these technologies. And I think that places a really significant responsibility to govern them properly on the companies that design them and then sort of obviously above that on governments in order to make sure that they're regulating to ensure that the companies are doing so in a way that is adequate. Jen, you're next on the list. If you could briefly introduce yourself. I'm a DFIL student in philosophy here. Um, so I wanted to pick up on a point that, that you were talking about and that Charlotte was also talking about, this question of um, who decides which values are kind of Im embedded and, and fine-tuned and how do we decide them. And one reaction to that might be that we should kind of encourage a plurality of systems that like are fine-tuned to different values. You might think one way to do that is to encourage uh, more companies to, to enter the space, maybe by reducing certain barriers to entry, where you have Sydney that's fine-tuned you know, to emphasize fairness more and other ones that are fine-tuned to emphasize other values. Or you might kind of take it in the extreme and say, at some point, maybe individual users can fine-tune um, the values according to like their own personal preferences. Uh, but then you might also think that like lots of risks come along with allowing, you know, too, too many types of value systems to be fine-tuned um, so I'm wondering what you kind of think about this potential trade-off between like encouraging a plurality of values, but also the risks that come along with doing that. Great question. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, good. So, yeah, and this is this is this chimes with the vision for for ChatGPT of the um, CEO of OpenAI, right? And he wants to enable it so you've got your sort of toggles, and then it's like you know, sort of broadly speaking. Um, kind of rules in idea of having these boundaries of what's reasonable and then within that you can kind of choose. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to reflect, like, I think that that is a, um, a plausible and attractive path if they do get, if it is possible to make them sufficiently safe to be widely deployed. Um, I think the thing that's interesting about it is it sort of, it invites us to draw a contrast between dialogue agents and for example um, the governance of online platforms. Um, you know, and I think that because the nature of dialogue agents as we're conceiving of them in this discussion and these particular things I'm talking about is that there'll be tools that individuals use um, that won't necessarily be subject to significant network effects. Um, I think it's, and that, that, won't, that will sort of not necessarily have effects kind of in the aggregate um, that are a function of, um, of these decisions about how they're individually governed. I think that there may be more reason to go with a kind of consent-based, kind of user-design-based approach. I think there are risks with it, which is that mainly that when you put the kind of, um, like, if there are problems that arise out of collective action when using these systems, um, then they're going to be such that individual user choice is going to make it harder to solve those problems. Um, we find that with, you know, with content moderation online, like if you, if you just make it the case that individuals are able to choose and you're going to get serious kind of um, negative externalities out of that at the collective level. Um, it may be true that that's, it may be the case that's also true for, um, for dialogue agents. Um, but prima facie, looking at them, you'd think that insofar as you're not really using, they're not really a sort of a node, uh, they're not really a, a hub for a bunch of people to connect to one another. It's more like you using it as your personal intermediary to connect to the world in your own way. I think having it tuned on your values and preferences is likely to be easier to, to justify. Um, but yeah, like you say, there will definitely still be sort of, um, you know, the Naples Ultra, the bounds beyond which it should not go. Okay, we have 10 minutes and three more questions in the room and two on YouTube. Are you happy for me to take the three in the room together? And then you can pick which ones oh, to respond to. Yes. yes absolutely. Well, no, I'll try and respond to them all, but I'll do it more succinctly. Wonderful. Uh, so we have you over there, then Milo, and then you in the blue shirt. Hi, my name is Ernesto. Thank you so much. Um, just um, briefly wanted to say something. I'm work, um, moved to the question, but I have worked with the Oxford Internet Institute and other institutions on content moderation. I think I'll be perhaps much more nuanced on the misinformation because the question is, are we really working it out? You know, 
considering the current information ecosystem that we have right now, which is highly, uh, where truth is highly contested, there's a lot of conspiracy theory. So I think perhaps this aspect, even if it has, has been commented, I don't think, well, Gary Marcus, for example, recently mentioned how, thanks to tools like GPT, you can move on from uh, putting out in this information campaigns of, from one million dollars to you know a couple thousand dollars, you know, like so. Uh, uh, illicit actors can use it, but anyways, um, what I wanted to mention is, are you, here we were discussing about political philosophy, and I agree, you know, it's very important to start looking at, but I'll say what type of political philosophy, and I was thinking about political philosophies where speech and rela relational um, interactions between, you know, authentic beings could take a center stage, how, um, we could say that we live right now in a society where perhaps relationality and speech have been devalued. So how would you kind of conciliate that with those type of philosophies, which could be, you know, Hannah Arendt, for example, Habermas, or even, you know, more Aboriginal uh, understandings of how to create a community? Hi, uh, Milo Phillips Brown. I'm at the Institute. Uh, okay, so we've been doing some normative ethics or no, normative philosophy of technology um, just for the moment let's let's forget about that and just do some philosophy of language and mind so so you said you know there's this concern well you didn't just say it there is this concern that these systems are just um, you know sophisticated autocomplete and I'm just sort of wondering like what am I then I mean especially you know you've got the once you once you say they're like a bit souped up we've got these different constraints. I mean, according to, to studysmarter.co.uk, Grice had four constraints that are supposed to, you know, guide conversation. They're not that complicated. I take it that these systems either can or are pretty close to being able to follow these rules. So if that's what I'm doing, what is it doing other than just communication? Well, maybe it has certain kinds of beliefs and desire. Maybe I have certain kinds of beliefs and desires that themselves are supposed to act as certain kinds of input to, you know, what it takes to assert or how to follow the crisis maxims. But also it looks like on some like minimal assumptions of belief and desire, it's got those too. Um, so yeah, what is it doing in communication that I'm not doing? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, my name's uh, Hayden Belfield, and I'm uh, I guess affiliated with the Levy Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence over in Cambridge. Um, so uh, I'm coming from a, a bit more of the kind of being concerned about some of the uh, long-term implications. Um, but I think the, the your kind of approach you've described as an agnostic one is exactly the right one, and uh, and certainly you know don't build AGI seems like a very good idea. Um, so I guess. One thing about uh, this, uh, Sydney, I agree that it, in itself it doesn't seem like like worrying, at, you know, at a, at a kind of large scale risk uh, uh, scale. But I think it does give us uh, a data point. So either uh, Microsoft didn't do RLHF as well as um, uh, OpenAI did for ChatGPT. Or they did, but RLHF doesn't work as well when you scale. Um, I think that's like, you know, that's, uh, we, I think we've got to go for one of those two things. And then both of them are worrying, but for different reasons, right? If it's, if it's the first one, then we've got to be worried about uh, companies rushing things out before they've actually worked out the kinks. And if it's the second one, then all the, all the kind of technical problems that might arise in terms of safety and bias and so on, uh, uh, that might be a data point that they're going to be harder as we scale these systems up. So I think that um, the more kind of sophisticated the points that I've heard are, are about that, right? It's like the thing itself is not worrying, but it's it's kind of gives us a data point. Uh, but then to take your kind of uh, invitation to consider what some of the problems might be of this particular, uh, you know, of of of, of dialogue agents. Um, I th I thought that your uh, the risks that you raised were very well taken. I think they're they're really good, but I think they focus a bit too much on kind of civilian uses and especially in democracies. So. I mean, uh, facial recognition has been like severely problematized in the West, not in China. Um, you know, uh, constraints that we would have on uh, you know government use of this or using that as a as a form of control might be. Uh, you know, I think we, we need to be worried about the kind of misuse and use to uh, control people 
in uh, authoritarian states of these kind of dialogue agents. Um, on the kind of disinformation, misinformation point, uh, I think one thing that uh, I, I find quite helpful, and I, I'd be interested in your view on whether you think this is right, is that uh, this is a shift from like handcrafting disinformation and misinformation to like mass producing it. And in particular, one thing that where that uh, that might be like particularly uh, interesting in terms of cost reduction is uh, around tailoring disinformation because you can just like feed every like the whole social media output of someone into a language model in a few years and get like you know really ta tailored disinformation for that person. Um, and then on the kind of large scale things, I think we we should be worried about that long term in terms of reducing our ability to together discard, to, um, you know decide on what's true and act on it, um, epistemic security, this has sometimes been called, and then especially in like crisis situations. Uh, so um, I was at a workshop on like uh, AI and nuclear in the last few days, and this is like the main thing they were worried about. It's not like automating stuff, but it's really about like how that, you know, in some sort of crisis, how do you know what's true? Um, and then finally, your point about universal intermediaries uh, worries me a lot because, it, you know, any safety problem in, in those kind of foundation models is or any security vulnerability is just going to get kind of replicated across, you know, large parts of the economy or society. And even if it, they're solved, there's still that kind of problem that it makes things more like kind of tightly coupled and raises systemic uh, risks. So, yeah, I just wanted to flag those kind of, well, maybe do, do you think it gives us this like data point about uh, concerns going forward and those kinds of uh, particular catastrophic risks around misuse, um, uh, disinformation and around uh, uh, incorporating it into our systems. Thanks. So if I can ask each of you to take no more than one minute to respond, that'd be fantastic to all of that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, on, the, um, on what kind of political philosophy, I think that, um, so one of the main things like Jeffrey mentioned is that um, I think that we should shift from thinking just about information to thinking about communication. I have a separate paper on communicative justice, which I'd, I'd love to share with you, which gets to some of those questions, especially drawing from Habermas. Uh, Milo, thank you for, pre for presenting me with the third rail and inviting me to lick it. Um, I, will, I will decline. Um, I remain agnostic. Uh, I don't do philosophy of language or philosophy of mind. Um, and this is one of the reasons, but not the only reason why. Um, Hayden, um, I think it can only be a data point when we know more. That's the thing that's so frustrating about it. And this is where that one thing I didn't mention but was in the handout, like transparency is the kind of central pillar of, of AI ethics and like the lack of it here is a problem. I think there's another possible interpretation of why Sydney went bananas. I think it's that if you have chat GPT level safety and you add search to that, then you're going to get a sort of bolderized version of the internet. It's going to be crap at doing search. Um, so I think that I, I wouldn't be surprised if actually it was still based on GPT 3.5, that it did have the same RLHF, it was just prompted differently. They've also for a while made it more engaging and assertive and, and those sorts of things. So it wouldn't actually surprise me if it was more an, like a sort of uh, another iteration rather than giving us further information. But honestly, you know, who the hell knows? As to these risks, yes, the point about what can be done with this in authoritarian states is chilling. Um, and, you know, I haven't got across that yet, but it immediately sort of, as you, as you were saying, I was just thinking, um, and then, you know, as to the nature of the problem with disinformation, yeah, I mean, look, absolutely, clearly going to be massive issues with this. I, I was more sort of, you know, maybe I was, I was downplaying this too much. I was more just indicating that I think that the, the solutions are going to be the same, not that the problem necessarily will have the same magnitude. I do think that the ways in which it's most sort of interestingly different, it, it strikes me that everyone always goes to greater personalization. I think then we're really thinking more about something more like manipulation. Um, you know, where it is directly engaging with you. And I think once you add that layer of like ongoing communication with you around a particular theme to persuade you, um, that's, that's where I think that there is a sort of a novel risk because that's the thing that is actually super, super costly to do um, if you're doing it sort of with people, but now becomes, you know, very, very cheap. Thank you, fantastic job responding to so much all at once. Uh, now, Jeff and Charlotte, would you like to take a few seconds to add anything that might have come to mind? Just that I think Seth's done a great job opening up what I really see as a, as a huge research agenda in this space. And so those of you in the room who are working in this, I think there's like a whole list of paper topics that uh, you can glean from tonight's discussion. You might even say it was generative ethics. Uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs>
and so topical as well. So I think it's great to see philosophy engaging with such topical issues. Wonderful. With that, please join me in thanking Seth, Jeff, and Charlotte.